Ladies and gentlemen, come gather around, come gather around, come gather around. Today, we're going to be talking about the fuel system. But this is going to be part one, old school technology carburation. Woohoo! So far on the course, we've learned about the engine. And we've learned about uh, how an engine works. And we've learned about pistons and piston pins and connecting rods and big ends and counterweights and the rotation of a motor and we've learned about cylinder walls and combustion chambers and we probably we will be learning about spark plugs in the next unit and we learned about intake and exhaust valves and we learned about the piston going down for the intake stroke and then we learned about the piston coming up for the compression stroke. And we learned about the piston going down. Really? Piston going down for the power stroke. And then we have the piston going back up for the exhaust stroke. Intake, compression, power, exhaust, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. What we want to talk about today is the fuel system and we're going to carry on here. So we've got an intake runner that goes up to here. And we're going to go up here and we're going to draw it pretty big. Kind of like this. It's going to be massive. You're going to be okay. This is where all the fuel and air are needing to get into our vehicle. We're going to talk carburetors. Carburetors is old school. We're talking 1890s technology here. You've got this. I know you're thinking, that's so old, Mr. Wellwood. Why do we even have to learn it? Well, I believe that by understanding how this old school system works, you'll be better able to understand how what we do today works. But here we go. There's two ways you can look about how the cylinder gets filled. One is with a vacuum, where this piston coming down the cylinder creates a vacuum and it sucks the air into the engine so we can use it. Another way to look at it is to say atmosphere is out here. When this thing goes down, this creates less than atmospheric pressure. And atmosphere can't stand a vacuum or a lower pressure area. So that atmosphere tries to flow down into here. If you're going to think vacuum pulls it in, then you're going to think about the engine's power is based strictly on how much this thing pulls. However, if you've ever driven your car in Vancouver, um, you'll find your car has a whole lot more power in Vancouver than it does here. Reason being is this. Here we are, Vancouver. I like Vancouver on a scale of 1 to 10, somewhere around no. So down here in Vancouver, I'm here and I'm happy, and above me is all of atmosphere. At sea level, you're looking at 100 kilopascals of atmospheric pressure. For you Americans, this would be 14.7 pounds per square inch. So on top of me, for every square inch of my body, I have 14.7 pounds pushing down on me. Which is why when Captain Hatfield is in outer space, he gets taller because he doesn't have that pressure on top of him. If we drive over to where we are in the Okanagan Valley, we go over the coastal mountains, and then we're here in the Okanagan Valley, and here I am, and above me is less air, to the tune of somewhere in the neighborhood of 95 kilopascals. It won't be 14.7 pounds, it'll be less. Maybe I'm a little taller out here, woohoo! But when we're here, you're used to this amount of atmosphere pushing into your engine. Drive down to Vancouver, you've got more atmosphere pushing into your engine. You're gonna fill the cylinder more. Up here, on the top of the coastal mountains, not the Rockies, this would be the Rockies, and then you get to like Calgary, and up in Calgary your power is even less than we have here. I have a face. And then here we'd be like, woohoo! Because it's a higher altitude, less atmosphere. So, atmosphere is trying to push into your cylinder. I knew a guy once who was a bit of a vacuum, and what we need to be able to do is control our engine speed. Knowing about atmospheric pressure trying to get into the cylinder, and that's what makes our engine run, how could we control the engine speed? Question over there. Can we just take the air away? What is this, space balls? You can't steal air, that's not gonna work. That seems excessive. Cool, but excessive. Another idea. Yep, 
what if we just sealed it off? That's actually going to work pretty good. There is many ways that we can seal off the air going to our engine to control the, uh, the engine speed. One is to put simply a plate inside here that will close this. So if I could have some kind of door down here that maybe goes like that, we could put it on a pivot, hook that up to my gas pedal, and then when I step on the gas pedal, I can open the throttle for medium speed, or my favorite, full speed. But let's just look at low speed at the moment. So if we've got this thing sealed off, that should work pretty good. Would you agree that if the engine is running and the throttle is closed, we're going to measure a lower amount of atmospheric pressure. Out here in the universe, we have atmospheric pressure trying to get into the motor. Over here, it's going to be a lower level of atmospheric pressure. In here, what we're going to be, we could, we could measure it, and what we want to measure here is manifold absolute pressure. What we mean by absolute is on a scale of Earth, What's the pressure in here? And if atmospheric pressure is like 95 kilopascals where we are, in here it might be like 30 kilopascals. A lower level of atmospheric pressure inside our engine. So if we have a lower amount of pressure, really we're kind of looking at a vacuum of some kind. So if I have a vacuum, how can I get fuel? Can you think of a way that if I've got vacuum in here, can you think of a way to get fuel into this airstream? Well, we could put a bucket on top and just have a hose fall into it. Okay, so we've got a, uh, a jerry can with a hose going into there. That would certainly suck it through, but, but have you ever siphoned fuel before? If you do, don't do it. You get a mouthful of gasoline, you burp gas for days. It's not really that cool. So, but if this would work, yeah, okay, we got fuel coming in. This thing's going to, it's going to suck fuel in there. The fuel's going to go into the airstream and it works. However, if I shut the car off, this is going to continue siphoning. I need a way to not have it siphon. If it siphons when the engine is off, then this thing's going to slowly fill up with fuel and I can't have that. So that wouldn't be a good idea. Question over here. Could we just use a pump? This is 1890s technology. We're not going to use a pump. That's, I mean, you could. There are fuel systems that do that, but that's not where I'm going with this one. We're going to stick with the old school, old school stuff. This kind of technology went until about the early 80s-ish. You got this. Question over here? Um, no. Okay. Would you agree if I have vacuum, I could maybe hook up a container and have it suck fuel up, and then when the engine shuts off, there's no vacuum, then the fuel wouldn't continue to come up. Okay, let's do that. Let's put a container down here. We could put a little opening. We'll put a tube down here. We'll fill it up with fuel. And then when the engine's running, and we have a vacuum in here, this would suck the fuel up that little tube and into the airstream. That works. We do have to add something, actually take it away. I'm going to have to put a little bit of opening here so that atmospheric pressure can come in this way, but I need some of it to go down here and push on that fuel so the fuel can come up here to try and equalize that vacuum. As long as this thing gets air in, fuel will come out. So that works. Problem, now what about, what about if I'm at full throttle? If I'm at full throttle, I'm not going to have any vacuum because there's nothing for the engine to suck against. So at full throttle, we're going to have the same atmospheric pressure all the way across. There's no vacuum. This isn't going to suck fuel in. How can I make that work for me? So what we want to do is find some way to lift the fuel depending on kind of how much air speed is going through this. The mass of air flow going through it because this air is going to have mass to it. Hmm, we need a new term here. Inside here, it's going to be... So if i got mass airflow going this way, I'm not going to have a lot of vacuum. I'm just going to have full atmospheric pressure. I do have a massive amount of airflow going through this. How can I use the flow of air to lift the fuel up? Can you think of anything that uses airflow and lift? Yep. My mom. Okay. Uh, wasn't planning on going there. Over here. How about like an airplane? Nice, good call. Let's look at an airplane. Way back in the battle days, you've got an airplane that looks like this. It's got a wing. Oh, 
Oh, Nelly. Now, if you got a wing like that, the air is going to come along and hit it, and there's going to be uh, the air is going to hit this. The air kind of hits this and kind of bounces up like that, and then flows over. Some of it's going to bounce and go this way, but not as much because that's got a bigger curve. This air has to travel a further distance, and you can look at this two ways. Air traveling over this, as air goes faster, the pressure drops and it'll rise. I like to look at the air hits this, bounces up, and because it bounces up, it's kind of like a, a low pressure area in here. And that low pressure area, less than atmospheric pressure, tries to counter that and it gives you lift going this way. You get some down here, but it's significantly less. So that then can make the airplane start to rise. Another way you can look at that, because I'm more into cars than airplanes, is you'll see on a race car, it's a wing that looks like this. And then when the air hits this, it has to go over that way, this is going to create lift. Which is not lift, in our world we call it downforce, and this will try to push the car onto the ground. I have a friend who builds race cars down in Vancouver, and he's got a vehicle that has a wing here, with another wing there, with another wing here. And you get so much downforce that as long as you go fast enough, there's enough airspeed, there's enough downforce, you'll make the corner. But if you check it out, and you're like, oh, I don't think I'm going to make it, and you lift and you slow down, you lose the airspeed, you lose the downforce, and you won't make the corner. So we, if we could take that shape and put that shape in here, we can use airspeed to lift that fuel. Let's make that happen. This was invented by a guy named Alberto Venturi, and this is called a Venturi. So now what happens, the air comes along, hits this, bounces in the middle, has to speed up. Air comes here, bounces in there, has to speed up, and then we create a low pressure area in here. So now, if I just tap into that with this sort of thing and put a passageway in like so, now when the air is traveling quickly, atmospheric pressure has to tighten, speed up, go fast, loses pressure. It's less than this pressure. This pressure comes in here, pushes the fuel down, and the fuel comes out trying to equalize that thing. So if I speed it up, the pressure drops, atmosphere pushes the fuel into the airstream, and then I get fuel coming out here, and my engine can run at full throttle. Cool! That'll work. Question though, what about part throttle? Where I kind of have like a lesser version of vacuum, and I have a lesser version of mass airflow. Now what? How can I get fuel into here when I don't have enough vacuum? I need more fuel than when it's closed. I need less fuel than when we're full open. I need something in between. How can I get more fuel into here for part throttle when I don't have as much vacuum and I don't have as much airflow? Question. Can we make the hole bigger? If I make this hole bigger, I'm going to have too much fuel when the throttle is closed. If I make this one bigger, I'm going to have too much fuel when the throttle is wide open. I need something in between. Yep. Could you just put another hole? I like the way you're thinking. Let's do that. Let's put another hole, like here. And maybe we could, we could probably tap it into this, or just bring it down to the same kind of thing like so. That could probably work as well. Air flow is going through here. Now, when the air comes around this guy, I guess I should do that in green. Now, when the air comes around here, it's tightening it up. It's reducing the pressure. We're getting, it's kind of like a miniature Venturi right there. And the air goes past, creates a low pressure area. Atmospheric pushes fuel up to here. Some fuel is going to come out of this guy. Some fuel is going to come out of there. Together, it should be enough to make the engine run. And if we open a little bit further, we may get to a point where a little bit less fuel is coming out of here, a little bit less fuel is coming out of here, but we're starting to get fuel coming out of there. We're trying to hope to magically hit all the movements of the throttle to control the engine speed so I can deal with idle, low speed, full throttle, and everything in between. It's hard to do with a carburetor. You can't really have a whole bunch of tubes all the way through, but you're hoping for the best. You're driving, you're at a traffic light, throttle's closed, vacuum, air is coming in through here, atmospheric pressure is coming in here, pushing the fuel down, fuel comes out, 
and we get fuel in our motor and it runs. And then a bus full of nuns pulls up beside us and we're like, oh yeah. But we want to show off, right? We want a hot rod and we like blip the throttle a little bit maybe and, and the light goes green and we stand on the gas pedal. Yeah, because that's cool. But we now have actually a significant problem because right now I have vacuum. I have lower atmospheric pressure in here. I got fuel coming out. If I punch the throttle, I suddenly lose all of my vacuum, but I don't have any mass airflow yet. So I have no airflow. I'm not going to get fuel. I just gave away the vacuum. I'm not going to get fuel. I'm not going to have anything. Oh my gosh, now what? You be there, you're like. <laughs> No, it's not going to work. How can I get fuel in there just to help it along from when I have vacuum to when I don't have airflow? I need something, little something, something to help me get going. What could I do? Yep. Could you just add another hole? I can't because I don't have airflow and I don't have vacuum. I need some other way, some intentional, deliberate way to get more fuel in here. Yep. Could you just put another hole in there? That, that's what they said. Uh, yep. Well, could you just put like some kind of a squirt gun in there and squirt some fuel in? I like that. Yes! If we could somehow have some kind of a squirt gun thing, maybe it looks like, it won't look like this, but let's say we got a squirt gun to squirt fuel in there and hook that up to the throttle so, cool, so that when this thing moves from closed to full open, when it's moving super quick, then this thing can go squirt, squirt, and we get a bunch of fuel in there just to help it out, to make it from the idle ports of fuel to the main ports of fuel. That would work. I like that. That would work out pretty good for us. So yeah, we have some kind of pump that's used for acceleration and we call that one an accelerator pump. And what we want to do is enrich the fuel. So we got acceleration, enrichment. And as you remember, rich means I have a lot. That's like too much fuel is a rich mixture. So when this thing flips open, we get a squirt of fuel, it enriches the mixture only when we're trying to accelerate. So that works. It'll look different than this. It might have like some kind of a lever that Let's move this over and make it look like that. We'll probably put like some kind of a connection down into here. Maybe some kind of a pump with a piston on the end. And then we could have this little passageway. So the throttle is connected to a linkage to this. And when I move the throttle quickly, this thing pushes down and the fuel is going to come along here and the fuel goes and we get fuel in there to help us along. That's our accelerator pump. That's acceleration enrichment. That works. Okay, next question. For all you guys with dirt bikes, you get in your dirt bike, you're trying to start it up so you can go ride with your buddies out in the toolies, and your bike doesn't start, and it doesn't start, and it doesn't start. What did you forget to do? Yep, put fuel in it. I can see that coming from you, but let's assume you got fuel in it. <clears throat> yep. You forgot to put the choke on. Nice, you've moved. You used to be over there. You could. What's the choke do? What happens when you are choking? Yep. You're not getting any air. Exactly. So if I could have some kind of device that can shut off the air to the engine, would you agree that vacuum is applied to here and vacuum is applied to here and vacuum is applied to there? Okay. So if I could put some kind of plate on there to seal that off, now, I have vacuum here, I got vacuum here, I got vacuum here. If I got vacuum on all of those, fuel's coming out of there, fuel's coming out of there, fuel's coming out of there. I'm getting a crap load of fuel. Engines don't run on fuel. The fuel has to vaporize. We've got to turn the fuel into vapor, and that usually needs heat. When it's cold outside, you don't have any heat. You, okay, you don't have much heat. Some of the fuel is going to turn into a vapor, but not a lot of it. So to make up for it, what we do is we just throw a crap load of fuel into the engine so that some of it will vaporize enough to make it run. 
The worst thing you can do with a vehicle is run it on the choke or cold all the time so you're just flooding fuel into your engine. We want enough fuel to make it run, just get it running, and we want that engine to warm up right away. Too much fuel is going to wash oil off the cylinders, thin the oil in the crankcase, you're going to wear your engine out. So you don't want it to be cold. Cold is from the devil. We throw in a lot of fuel, some of it will vaporize, hopefully enough of it vaporizes that it runs. And then as it warms up, you want to take the choke off so that we don't continue flooding the motor. We'd lose the vacuum here, but it should be hot enough to make it work. Let's assume we have a throttle. I didn't draw the throttle back in. And now we don't have vacuum there, we don't have vacuum there, and now we're back to normal. That works pretty cool. In the bad old days, you'd have a mechanical lever, you'd pull on the dashboard, <clears throat> and it would seal that off, you'd fire the engine up, and it would run, and then as you drove, you'd push that little lever in, just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. Other manufacturers have done this different ways too, but there's always a way to control it to get it rich when it's cold outside. Do you notice, with your parents' vehicle, when you fire it up on a first thing in the morning, it runs at a faster speed than normal? Usually with a choke, the choke is connected to the throttle, so if the throttle is closed, sorry, so that if the choke is closed, the throttle is going to be open a little bit more. That just lets some of that vacuum reach all of these, plus it gets you to a higher idle speed so that your engine can actually run when it's getting too much fuel. So that's part of our cold start. And the cold start, we need our engine to be pretty rich. Let's go back and look at when we're cruising along. When we're cruising along in the engine, we're going to have the throttle somewhere maybe half open or so. We're going to get a little bit of vacuum here, getting some fuel out of there, maybe a little bit more of a fuel coming out of here. We're going to get a significant amount of fuel coming out of here. Um, but we're going to run into an issue at full throttle as opposed to when we're cruising. And when we're cruising, we want to have kind of a lean mixture. I'm going to put a question mark because it kind of depends how lean it is. Normally for cruising, we're going to be wanting to run around 14.7 to 1 air to fuel. That's a good mixture for perfect combustion. At wide open throttle, things are going to be a little different. We don't have the vacuum here. We've got a lot of atmospheric pressure. We've got a mass airflow that's really big coming through here. We've got lots of air coming in, lots of turbulence, lots of combustion, lots of power. There's lots of things going on. And this nice, perfect mixture is not going to be acceptable for wide open throttle. We want to run a bit richer for wide open throttle. Usually to the tune of 12 and a half to one pounds of air to pound of fuel, which is kind of rich. It's not going to be perfect combustion, but it will make good power. It'll also cool things a little bit in here so we don't burn stuff. So if I've tuned these, if the holes in here are perfect sizes for cruise, I'm not going to have enough fuel at wide open throttle. If I change everything to work perfectly for full throttle, it's going to be too rich for cruising and I won't get good fuel economy. So what I need is yet another thing to give me a bit more fuel to get uh, full throttle 12 and a half to 1 when I'm at full throttle. How can we do that? Yep. Can't we just add another hole? Sort of, actually. You're kind of on the right path. Let's look down here and see what we can do with this. What if we could have Maybe let's bring this thing around and do something like this. And what if we could have like this thing sized beautifully for full throttle and then when we're cruising we could just like plug some of it up. Make, if we could make the hole smaller. Keep in mind this is 1890s technology. We need to make this thing work for us. Some manufacturers will have a tapered pin to help plug that hole hooked up to a piston with a spring then that thing goes up to measure vacuum inside the intake manifold. If the throttle is closed we need blue. If the throttle is closed, we've got high vacuum. That high vacuum is going to suck this down and the tapered pin will plug up that hole. When I go full throttle, we lose the vacuum, the spring pushes it out, it pulls the pin out of the hole and we get more fuel coming out of that way. That works pretty cool. There's other ways of doing it. This is one way to do it. Maybe you make changes to your motor and now you need more fuel at full throttle. Well, you could make a different size pin, you could make a bigger hole. There's different ways that you can get more fuel if you had to. 
but you really want to shoot for that mixture. Don't just throw fuel in because you think you need it. You want to be having the right amount of fuel. There's one last thing you ought to think about on this one, and that's this. Would you agree that as I'm driving my vehicle, this level of fuel is going to get lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and lower? And would you agree that if the fuel level is really low, it's going to take a lot of vacuum to suck the fuel all the way up that tube? And would you agree that if the fuel level is really high, it's not going to take very much vacuum to come out of here? If that's the case, your engine will be rich when it's got a full tank of gas and lean when it's got an empty tank of gas and you'll notice the power change as the fuel level gets lower and lower and lower. I had a lawnmower that I could tell that the fuel tank was getting too low because it started running worse when the tank got near empty. So can you think of something in your house that controls a level depending on what's going on in there and if the level goes down it can replenish it for you. Can you think of something in your house that controls that? <laughs> Toilets are wonderful things. Okay, so let's put maybe a fuel inlet in here and we're going to make this go outside of our vehicle and let's label that fuel and you could have fuel pumped in with a pump it's 1890s technology you could just have fuel come in with gravity that's why your motorbikes have the gas tank up top and your engine down below so that gravity feeds the fuel in there on the old Model A's Ford Model A you got the cowl, you got the radiator grill, you got the headlights. Oh man, it's already coming back. Reminds me of when I, you had to have flames, right? So yeah. Okay, so here is where the gas tank was. And the engine had the carburetor down low, so gravity would feed it. Let's put some kind of stopper on there. We'll hook it up to a pivot. And then we'll have some kind of a floaty thing in there. So that as the fuel level comes down and this drops, fuel comes out. And then when the fuel level comes back up, it seals it off. You use a bit of fuel, opens, replenish. You don't need much fuel, doesn't open very much, doesn't replenish very much. So this wonderful circuit inside here is the float. Just like a toilet. And that can maintain the fuel level so it's always consistent inside the vehicle. Incidentally, you put your dirt bike away for a winter or your lawnmower or your chainsaw or your weed whacker or anything that's carbureted, you want to drain all the fuel and drain the float bowl. Some uh, small engines have a little drain so you get the fuel out of there because the fuel is going to age and that's not going to work well in your vehicle. So we talked about idle speed, uh, low speed and cruise, we talked about full throttle, we talked about the, this circuit here, this is your power circuit that gives you power for full throttle. We've got atmospheric pressure. Higher altitude is less pressure, less power. We're just changing how much atmospheric pressure gets into here. We talked about rich and lean. Uh, idle, we'd like to see idle kind of here, but some engines just don't like running on that. When I'm tuning for cold start and when I'm tuning for idle, I tune for whatever makes the engine run nice. Uh, we'd like it to be 14.7. I have one vehicle that will not idle at anything uh, leaner than 13 to 1. So it kind of depends. Whatever makes it happy is usually what I tune for. We talked about Excel enrichment for when this thing is moving. We talked about fuel and the float level so that we can control the level of fuel inside there and make it consistent. We talked about cold start with a choke to seal off the air so we can have a richer mixture into our engine. We talked about a Venturi, so when we have mass airflow going through there, or when we have uh, manifold absolute pressure inside here, which is vacuum, manifold absolute pressure. We talked about temperature for cold start. This is working pretty good. We have a carburetor just working like that. Let's look at a carburetor. We've got a couple things going on. Up at the very top, the air filter would be up here. This is the choke. Notice this one, this side doesn't have a choke. This is a slightly different style of carburetor. This is a two barrel, because there's two barrels to work off of. Generally you drive around on this one, and then when you need more power, this guy would open up and give you more power. If you can stay on this, you got better fuel economy. In here you can see the two passages for fuel. 
This one down here at the very, very bottom, closest to the engine, we're looking at it upside down. That's the idle fuel port. This one down here closer to the throttle, that's your transition port. That's exposed to a bit of vacuum when you're at a low speed. This one doesn't really idle a whole lot. It's only used when you're cruising or needing some full throttle. So it really deals with fuel in the Venturi. And you can see up through the top, we got actually a couple Venturis going on. We've got the main big Venturi inside there. And then we've got this extra Venturi, kind of like my buddy's stack of wings. This is a booster Venturi, just gives you a stronger vacuum signal for the fuel to come out the hole. You can see the little passageway here. In the bad old days, as your engine got older and older and older, you would need to tune it. Maybe you need a little bit more fuel or a little bit less fuel. Well, this is a way that you could tune the idle mixture. And this screw, if you take it out, it's got a taper to it. So it's, it just plugs up that port inside here a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit less. Need more fuel, you unscrew this, it makes the hole bigger. You need less fuel, you thread it back in. This lever here that goes from the throttle to this pivot to this thing, inside here is a little piston, kind of like a squirt gun. When you move the throttle, this thing builds pressure and squirts fuel. It'll squirt, squirt fuel into the airstream. This choke is controlled by electricity. When the engine is cold, this thing is not heated up yet. It's kind of like a tea kettle. Electricity from a running engine goes to here and it slowly heats up and heats up and heats up. It starts to open the choke and open the choke. There's the float. Fuel comes in through here. The needle and seat on the top here to shut off the flow of fuel is there. When the fuel level comes up, the float rises. When it gets to the right level, it seals off the flow of fuel into the float bowl and then we can maintain how high the fuel should be. The Japanese are pretty smart. They put a big glass window with an etched line so you could tell where your fuel level should be. Hey, it's my Tanaka chainsaw. Watashi no number one Tanaka desu. If you want to start this thing, this is what you have to do first. You pull the choke. If you don't pull the choke, it doesn't seal off the front of the carburetor, you don't get the extra fuel, it's not going to start for you ever. Once you get it running and it runs on its own, I can pull this and it automatically releases the choke. <gasps> but wait, there's more! Hey! This is my Echo, 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 Weed Whacker, Weed Whacker, Weed Whacker. That's the choke. Once it gets running, I can push it to open and I can do all my weed whacking that I want to do. The mixture screws are here in the top. Inside there and a screw down inside there, I can change the fuel for idle or high speed. This is my daily driver. It is 1977 Chevy pickup. It is carbureted. Let's have a look. Under the hood, basic V8, we got the air filter housing. In the bad old days with carburetors, you needed to have hot air to help vaporize the fuel. So what this uses is a little bit of hot air piped off of the exhaust manifolds up into here. This thing closes so you don't get any fresh air into the motor and it takes all of the air from here hot off the exhaust pipes. So you get hot air into your motor. That helps it warm up. This carburetor is a four barrel. It has two primary barrels that are very small so you get good fuel economy and when you need to pass that bus full of nuns, these guys open and you have great big freaking huge barrels in there to cut your fuel economy into a fraction of what you thought you could get. Right here underneath this hose you can see one of the mixture screws. There's a mixture screw on that side so I can tune the idle of both sides of this carburetor. You see the same lever, the pivot, and accelerator pump. Over on this side the choke runs off of hot air from the intake manifold which is kind of hokey but that's how it works. When I parked this last the engine was up to temperature, so the choke is still open. This is an automatic choke, and for carbureted vehicles, almost all carbureted vehicles, the first thing you do when you get into the vehicle is step on the gas pedal to set the choke. Then you can turn the key.